May I, should I take about two or three questions sure, at a sure. time and then let you yeah. answer them? Um, who, are there any initial no questions? Comments. Can we keep them a bit short? And would you also identify yourself when you raise your question? I'll yeah, say, move, we have uh, Francoise and then Nolita. I'll come back to that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It was very interesting. It's also, my name is Francoise Caillou, former staff member, and I'm French. And I'm also, I must say, it is refreshing to hear that the problems are huge elsewhere. We tend to think that the problems are huge here. Take heart. Why, <laughs> and that we, we, would learn, we should learn more from the U.S. Anyway, I want to follow on the point that were made earlier. It is true it is a lot easier to equalize and to have an equal education system in a society which is fairly equal. When you are dealing in a society which is unequal, which is a case in the U.S., which is also the case in France, it is a lot more difficult. And there is no easy, absolute solutions for any problem. I take the example of kindergarten in French, in France. Kids go to kindergarten, preschool, as from the age of three. Everybody, three, four, five. So they all go to three years of preschool education before they enter the primary school. Yet, the vocabulary gaps that you're talking still exist because everybody learns and the gaps expand. And the gap expands from kindergarten till the end of, uh, the end of college, which is lower secondary. Uh, that is, we have to work with society. You are right, we have to be, but we probably have to have more affirmative action than we do have. Uh, because otherwise everybody benefits, that's what we say, everybody benefits from kindergarten. Where you are also extremely right is the fact that we need to invest a lot more in, in teacher education. So you mentioned the case of Finland. Probably, I don't know the, so much the others, but there are countries where being a teacher is highly rewarded, highly considered. How do you change this figure for, in a country where being a teacher is not such a high level, uh, prof it's such, not such a high level profession? How do you change the image? How do you make it a very professional education so that the best, I mean, I heard that is a, a McKinsey report, that the best students want to become teachers. How do you do that? Well, How do you change the culture of a school as well? Yeah. It's, it's not just it's salary, but it's more Natasha? than salary. Let me, let me answer that because it's another complicated question. Um, let me give you an example from a U.S. state, okay? Because we, uh, everything I said about the U.S. is highly variable. We have some states that invest a great deal in, in education. They tend to be in New England, Massachusetts, Vermont, Maine, Etc. They're always our highest achieving states in Connecticut. They invest the most in teachers and so on. Um, New Jersey just joined them from the <laughs> mid-Atlantic. They became a New England state. Um, but in 1987, Connecticut did a reform. They got a commission. They came up with a set of recommendations. And it was about professionalizing teaching was their path to reform. Very interesting story. They raised salaries to the top in the region, and they actually became the top in the country because that region is a high spending region. But they raised standards at the same time. They raised standards in several ways. They raised standards for the qualifications, the basic academic qualifications to become a teacher, you know, grade point average, etc. They also required teacher education to become more intense, rigorous, and high quality. So you had to both have more background in content but also in content pedagogy, how to teach that content, how to teach special education students, another key factor in Finland's reform. If you can teach kids who struggle to learn, the theory is that you can teach almost every kid because you've learned how to individualize and differentiate, say that they did the same thing that Finland has done in theirs. Uh, strong literacy training for all teachers from elementary through high school, uh, et cetera. Um, there was a combination of uh, requiring much stronger accreditation standards for schools of ed so that they couldn't continue to operate unless they met these standards and candidates meeting higher standards as well, earning very high salaries, uh, the highest in the nation. And they uh, equalized, this is very important, they gave that money in a way that gave more money to the poor districts and less money to the wealthy districts to meet a minimum high salary level for teachers. So if you were in New Haven, which is a high need uh, community in, in Connecticut. I went to school there at Yale as an undergraduate. I could teach in the public schools without even a bachelor's degree at that time because they had such shortages. 
Um, my daughter went back there several years later. She couldn't even get a teacher's aid position with a bachelor's degree because they were fully certified and had all of these, had met all these standards. So they also said you had to have a master's degree to continue your license and so on. So they did that. They put in place professional development. Uh, the status of teaching went way up. Everybody wanted to be a teacher. Uh, within a few years, within three years, they had eliminated shortages completely. Three years is all it took. And I've seen many other districts where that's been the case. It doesn't take long if you equalize and raise salaries um, to eliminate shortages. Uh, but then it became a highly desired profession. And within a few years, most of their teachers were coming from the top third of selective universities in the state. People wanted to become a teacher. And within 10 years, Connecticut became the highest achieving state in the country on reading, math, science, um, and um, writing because they had just improved the quality of teaching to that extent. So it's a combination of teacher learning, teacher salaries, teacher standards, um, all of those things. You know, and then, the, and then you have to have politicians and other leaders, business leaders and others, who say being a teacher you know, matters. They also, by the way, raise the quality of principles at the same time. And that's very important because where, where a teacher will teach um, you know, depends a lot on whether they have a knowledgeable and skillful principal. So they did a huge principal reform at the same time. Um, and they have remained among the top achieving places in the country. And there are parts of the country where they do not struggle to get teachers and where it is well respected. Uh, and then there are places where teachers are bad mouthed all the time and where they pay them poorly and, you know, um, so. And Finland, you know, was, was not always as it is now. In the, in the 1960s, Finland was not considered a high achieving nation. It was in Scandinavia, everyone looked down their nose at Finland. The outcomes were very inequitable. Um, they had a very rigid testing system that allocated people into, um, they had very rigid curriculum guidelines that allocated people into different tracks. They did a lot of detracking. They did not train teachers particularly well. It was a big reform that raised the quality of, the, of preparation um, as well as, you know, then. Uh, bringing that kind of sense of respect. But I don't think you can get respect without deep, sophisticated preparation to teach that, that people acknowledge is really um, what a professional needs to have. And you have to do it for everyone, not some teachers. Because if there are any teachers who are allowed in who are not adequately prepared to do a good job, the whole profession takes a black eye. So this idea that you can let some people in to teach the poor and minority kids who don't have any training, who are going to come in and out, uh, really deprofessionalizes the, the whole status of the profession. Nolita has a question and then Saba. You can take a couple more. Oh, thank you. I'm Nolita Vuguza from South Africa. Well, one, I stand for form <laughs> and, and later for substance. It's just that I can't just watch the debate without hearing what Africa is about in the debate. So I'm just standing up to say, um, as I listen to you and I'm wondering about the other, the, th the issues that we have back at home in South Africa and in Africa about the issues that you, you're you mentioning. Uh, just after apartheid, we also went the whole way. We started with the, you know, the trying to um, enforce the culture of learning and teaching which had been um, forgotten and unlearned during apartheid. And after doing that, we came back and we focused on the curriculum. And after that, we went back and we said we want outcomes-based education. Up until the teachers were completely overwhelmed and they did not understand that what they were supposed to teach. <laughs> and here we are today wanting to listen to global conversations about what to do. Also, every July, there's always a union uh, petition in government in terms of salaries, but also, and teachers are grossly underpaid. But there isn't one week of research that shows that at least one week after they, are incre they have had increased, the results increased at least for one week. So we can fix these things. We can fix them, we can fix everything, but it does seem to me that there is also something between the learner and the teacher and the environment that is not in sync with one another. And it just goes beyond the language, as in language, as in France, as in, as, as in Corsa, which I am, as in English. It goes to, is the learner hearing the things that a learner wants to hear and is the teacher? So it goes 
beyond this. It also goes to the environment. If there are better environments like the ones we've seen, but they don't, they don't arrest the global problem of what we're about today. So what is it that is missing between the teacher and the learner and the environment? And what is also in the methodology? Because again, you can do these things, we can reinvent the wheel, we can relearn, we can unlearn, we can learn. But today we still are faced with the problem of education. So is it methodology? If at all we were supposed to retrain the teachers, were we going to get the results that we're getting? What is the language between the teacher and the learner that is going to make the learner understand what the teacher wants? So it's a great, that's more than a question. <laughs> it's not really a question. Uh, but I just would make a com one brief comment about it, which is that when a teacher is really well prepared, uh, part of what a teacher learns to do is, as Paolo Freire put it, they learn how to learn from the learners. What it is that they bring to the conversation. Uh, observing, listening, uh, building a knowledge base about where the learners are, not only in their levels of rec you know, uh, prior experience and knowledge and skill, but also the learners' experience and perspectives and so on. Uh, to bring this, Dewey said, the child to the curriculum and the curriculum to the child, um, you have to know not just your subject and how to stand up and say it. You have to know a lot about learning and development and the children you're teaching and the experiences that they've had and what they bring and what they know. So you have to have a set of pedagogical tools that are very specific about being able to put those things together in the context of the environment. Now, that doesn't, I want to just say, the teacher is important. Principles are important, but that cannot be seen as what overwhelms everything else in the environment. You still need materials and reasonable class sizes and, you know, a context to teach in. And uh, in the U.S., the conversation right now is almost, is, is too much about the teacher matters more than anything and nothing else matters. So we have teachers with, and I know you have this in South Africa too, we have teachers with 50 kids in a class. And I know you have some kids with, you have 100. I've, I've worked with some of the teachers and teacher educators in South Africa who say, how would we do this, you know, reform-oriented mathematics? I have 100 kids and we meet under a tree. You know, so it's, you know, it's, it's those contexts, of course, have to be uh, part of it. But we can help teachers learn certain pedagogies that can make them more effective if they also have those, you know, resources around them. Um, it's a big as I said, it's more than a question. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your inter very interesting talk. Fascinating. Uh, my question links very well to what you just finished saying. It, I'm interested in hearing your political analysis what, on, on the basic reasons for this change that happened over the last 30, 40 years. Um, and because I sometimes think that we make a very <coughs> simple political analysis. Um, I think there was a there was a lot of consensus uh, and political agreement uh, between different various uh, political forces in many societies, um, let's say in the 60s and the 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, and still in Europe, that's in some countries still the case. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think the basic change that happened was the end of the welfare consensus in some way, end of the welfare state consensus in some countries. But what is your, in your view, the, the the very important element in conservative thinking, in the conservative revolution, uh, which made these things happen. Uh, as you said, um, early child, the, the early f days of No Child Left Behind was based on a bipartisan consensus. And still many people in the Com Democratic Party uh, support uh, the, the, the legislation. Um, but what happened with the conservative revolution that made so many people uh, on the right uh, change their minds because this is a, this is an important movement in, ma in many countries and we should not be very simple about it. Um, but what is in your what, your view the the basic element of the, of what made the right move so much to the conservative side? Ah, uh, 
That's also not a question. That's like a <laughs> that's very big. I, I am not a political expert, but I have a few ideas, and others may be able to chime in and offer more ideas because uh, this is not I'm not a political scientist. Uh, one of the arguments that happened at the beginning of the Reagan Revolution, with respect, which was in the early 1980s, with respect to um, and of course that was right on the heels of Margaret Thatcher, so there was the international component because the education reforms were similar but was the transformation of the dialogue, um, the notion that money doesn't matter and we should only attend to school outputs and not to inputs, was part of what um, uh, became a philosophy, that outcome-based, results-based education uh, was promoted. Now, when we stopped paying attention to inputs, and in fact, in the United States, several databases, federal databases that could allow you to measure what kind of resources were going into different schools were, uh, were ended, were terminated. So it was very hard to keep track of the question of inputs. Um, then outputs became defined as standardized tests. Uh, and so then the, the goal became test scores. Um, and without respect to inputs, we had testing without investing. Um, increasingly, and then as certain other, you know, over the course of the next three decades, the inequalities that had been reduced began to expand in terms of resources and inputs. Um, the other thing I think was the notion of education as a private good, that it really is about, um, you know, each, each person should get the best education. Now you can, you can mobilize choice around two different theories. One theory is choice as competition. And we get the schools and they compete with each other and you, know, you have winners and losers and parents will get in that mix and they'll choose very little attention in that theory of action. Competition is supposed to breed improvement by itself. Uh, very little attention to whether there are schools worth choosing and whether every child will be chosen because ultimately schools become the choosers in some cases more than families becoming the choosers. Uh, if, if you don't regulate it, if you don't manage it, if it's not an access philosophy. You can also uh, support choice, as I do, around a theory of a equitable access, innovation, and um, individual match. That is, some kids really want to study, you know, um, they want to be um, in music and the arts, and they can go to a spectacular such school, and a school could specialize. But in that kind of system, which some American districts have tried to do, and some have been relatively successful, the goal is, if a, and this is also true in Singapore, if a school is not doing well, you don't just let it fail. The government's role is to come in and make sure that the quality of the education is high quality, and to make the investments, and then to require of every school that it provide access, um, that it, you know, it teach all, all kids, or at least uh, not discriminate along race, income, ethnicity, and uh, um, disability or ability status. Um, and so you can have different outcomes, but we really went for the competitive, we went for the uh, education as a private good and results-based education. I don't know if that's what you were getting at, but I think that's those, that became a very um, consensual, commonplace way to talk about education. And then the policies sort of followed that line of thinking. At the point where we finally got uh, evidence about this growing inequality again, and people began to take up the issue again, which is in the last uh, 10 years, uh, you know, then the other theories of, of educational access have begun to come to the fore. But No Child Left Behind, although it was cloaked in equity, was designed for inequity. There were, no, there were no mechanisms in No Child Left Behind to equalize access to resources for schools. Mm -hmm. It was really all about driving uh, test scores. Thank you, Leslie. I'll be very short and blunt. Uh, listening to you, uh, I can only conclude that we are very far from getting it right. But as members of the international community, we are looking at UNESCO you know, to point the direction and I'm requesting you to make a comment on the relevance of UNESCO as the UN agency that is mandated to point a direction on education internationally. That's my first question. That's I didn't catch the question. The relevance of UNESCO oh. as the UN agency that is mandated to point the direction for countries on education. 
The second question is that I did not hear you uh, saying anything or mentioning uh, uh, worker representatives or unions in the U.S. Uh, education sector. You know, what is their role? Are the is the teacher profession unionized, like in South Africa, for instance? Thank you. Uh, so, on the question of UNESCO's relevance, um, again, I'm not an expert in the in international comparative education, but from my own limited perspective, I think it's highly relevant and important in the discourse about education. I use UNESCO reports um, to understand what's happening in countries around the world and uh, have colleagues who participate in the conversations to help shape and, and frame um, the, the way in which countries are learning from each other. So. Um, from my little corner of the globe. Uh, with respect to unions, yes, we do have unions. Um, maybe not for much longer, but we do have, <laughs> we do have teachers unions. Um, and they have taken a big beating in the public uh, discourse. Um, in many cases, you know, a lot of these problems of low achievement and failing and so on are, are attributed to, to unions um, in particular and by reference to teachers. Um, so. We do, but most teachers do belong to unions. Um, I could talk about teacher unions for a long time, but maybe I'll just try to make a couple of points. One is that, in my experience, uh, while uh, you, collective bargaining agreements in the United States can be very constraining, um, the content of those agreements has been as much because of management decisions as it has been uh, union uh, decisions, I mean, that both have come together to create the collective bargaining agreements, but they're really, the real problem is they're out of date because they're based on factory model schools of, you know, the 1940s and 50s. And so we need to move forward beyond some of the constraints of existing collective bargaining agreements. Uh, but in my experience in, in pursuing productive reforms, as many of them have been proposed by unions, uh, as by management. I mean, they're both, the, the notion that unions are exclusively anti-progress and, uh, and school boards are unanimously pro-progress is, does not bear out. I mean, I, I can think of any number of uh, professionalization reforms, raising standards for teachers, um, improving the design of schools that have been, you know, uh, negotiated by unions and management with unions leading the way as much as the opposite. Uh, but, but we are at a, a very negative place with respect to the, the discourse around that topic in the United States. Um, it's hard for uh, those in the U.S. who are very anti-teacher union to deal with facts like the fact that in Finland 99% of teachers are unionized and that you know, in many high achieving countries, everyone belongs to a union. But in the highest achieving countries and those that have been making the most investments, <coughs> teachers' salaries, as somebody mentioned earlier, are comparable to the salaries of other college graduates. Um, in Singapore, the government sets the salaries um, so that they are very high and, and not long ago were equivalent to the salaries of beginning doctors in government service. Um, in many countries, um, Japan is one, they'll peg teacher salaries to what engineers and other professionals make, so you don't have shortages of math and science teachers because you're paying comparably. The governments actually see it as a, a useful thing to set a high teacher salary. The union doesn't have to bargain for it. In the U.S., the dynamic is that the school boards see it as their role to keep the salaries as low as they possibly can. And then t unions see it as their role to try to get the salaries and working conditions bettered. If you live in a society where governments as a whole think that teachers should earn a good wage, like other professionals, and that, that would actually raise the quality of education overall, and you don't have to argue about that, then unions are free to spend their time building professional development and learning opportunities and the quality and status of the profession. And that's what you see unions doing in Singapore and Finland and some other places because they're not fighting about how much teachers are going to earn. So the, the issues of teacher unions around the world are a very interesting one. And we could probably spend another two hours on it. 